Straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. This is day three of Claudia Drury's testimony. We're still on direct examination. And part of it is that it keeps getting interrupted. Federal court is delayed when the defendant is carted out on a stretcher for the second time. And from Theranos CEO to federal court, opening statements are presented in the trial of Ramesh Sonny Bawani, plus a $6 million fake jewelry scam. The profits from the sale of counterfeit goods is, is really lucrative. How investigators work to track down the counterfeit kingpins. But first, the potential sentence in this case is death. The latest developments in the case of the Doomsday Duo. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Just days after an Idaho judge rules the so-called doomsday duo will be tried together, Chad Daybell's defense motions to dismiss murder charges in the case. Chad Daybell and his wife, Lori Vallow Daybell, face charges in the deaths of Lori's two children, J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan, as well as Daybell's first wife, Tammy. The pair were dubbed the doomsday duo for a shared belief in the end of days. The couple was married in 2019, just weeks after Daybell's wife mysteriously died in her sleep, and Vallow Daybell's youngest children went missing. Tammy Daybell's body was later exhumed, and in June 2020, the remains of J.J. and Tylee were recovered on Chad Daybell's property. Since then, there have been questions surrounding Vallo Daybell's ability to stand trial after she was initially deemed incompetent. The outcome of a recent psychiatric evaluation has not been released, but a trial for the couple is scheduled for early next year. At a hearing on Wednesday, Chad Daybell's attorneys argued their client could not face charges in the death of his first wife, Tammy. The potential sentence in this case is death. The severity of this case in this court uh, address that in a, in a prior decision that you uh, set forth, and I believe that was in your memorandum regarding the venue. And you cited that death is different. And the magnitude of the charge, Judge, is what's important here. And when you're considering the, the validity or the impartiality of a grand jury proceeding judge, you have to take, consider, you have to take into consideration the consequence that's a result of that. So there needs to be a higher scrutiny and a higher review of the standards that are set forth. All right, let's take a higher review of this case. Joining us today is criminal defense attorney Adam Conta and Terry Austin. Adam, it looks like the Daybells will be tried together. Is that the right ruling? And should Chad's defense attorneys have maybe pushed a little harder to separate the cases? Well, I think the standard for whether cases are tried together or not for most judges is just essentially, is the evidence the same? Are the charges the same? And is it a waste of money, essentially, and time if we try these cases separately? In this particular instance, the answer to all those questions are yes. The evidence is the same for both of them, or pretty much. The charges are the same. The facts are the same. So to try them separately would, in fact, be a huge waste of time. The caveat here, though, is that we have no idea how long Lori Vallow Daybell is going to be found mentally unfit. So yeah, if I was his attorneys, I'd be screaming from the rooftops. Like, what are we doing here, Judge? This man has a right to trial. He has a right to have his case heard in front of a jury, and that is being postponed indefinitely. You can't just do this to my client forever. And unfortunately, that's what's going to happen, at least for the foreseeable future. Now, early next year is a pretty long time to wait for trial. Terry, the trial is set to be heard in Ada County, 300 miles from Fremont County. Does the change of venue help find a jury? You know what, Brian, it's going to be very difficult to find a jury no matter what county it is in, whether it's Fremont, whether it's Madison, whether it's Ada County, which, as you say, is 300 miles away. But I do think Judge Boyce made the right decision here. At least there'll be some chance that you'll get jurors who haven't heard of the case, but it's going to be a very small chance. But he also is preserving the fact that this is not going to be an issue on appeal. The defendant obviously has this right to have a fair trial, and this will give that opportunity to get those jurors who might have not heard about the case. Absolutely. Now, while Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow Daybell's cases will remain tied together, the parents of the accused Oxford, Michigan high school shooter are now being charged separately. In a pretrial hearing this week, a circuit court appointed the pair different attorneys. Jennifer and James Crumbly appeared in court briefly on Tuesday, where Judge Cheryl Matthews voiced concern about a potential conflict of interest should the couple retain the same attorneys. Within the next two weeks, both Jennifer and James Crumbly will meet with separate independent attorneys. Right now, they're due back in court on April 5th. Both are charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter following the shooting spree at Oxford High School last November.
Prosecutors say their 15-year-old son opened fire in the school, killing four students and injuring others. He faces charges of first-degree murder, assault with a deadly weapon, and terrorism. In Nevada, investigators search for a missing 18-year-old who they say was kidnapped from her own vehicle. Officials say Irion, Naomi Irion was last seen on March 12th when she was abducted from a Walmart parking lot, about 30 minutes from Reno, Nevada. Surveillance video shows a man approaching Irion's vehicle and later driving off in her car. Investigators are now calling for help to identify the suspect and the vehicle of interest, a Chevrolet 2500 year 2020 or newer. At a press conference this week, Irion's family asked the public to come forward with any new information. Don't post about it without talking to law enforcement first. Don't do anything without talking to law enforcement first. This is life or death for my sister. Life or death. I don't care if you think it's insignificant or if you need other people's approval. You need no one's approval before calling law enforcement. This is life or death for a beautiful and fun and amazing sister, daughter, and friend. She was just she is, starting. She is. She is. She's just starting her adult life. If you have any information about Irion's whereabouts or the person of interest, please call the number on your screen. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, after several delays, the federal trial is now underway for Theranos COO Ramesh Sonny Balwani. But first, $6 million worth of fake jewelry seized in Kentucky, how investigators track down the criminals behind the scheme. Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily. Millions of dollars worth of counterfeit jewelry makes its way into the U.S. each year. And recently, custom agents seized the cache of watches and rings with some high-end names. Law & Crime's Angela Levy is here with what was seized and where the fake goods are sold. Brian, think about a Rolex watch. You know, a lot of people may want one and turn to the Internet in search of one, but it's very possible what you're buying and finding online could be fake. Now, recently, Customs and Border Protection Agencies in Louisville, Kentucky, came across a shipment of fake watches, earrings and rings valued at $4.5 million. A short time later, they found another $2 million more of fake jewelry. And now, these are photos of some of those counterfeit items. Counterfeiters sometimes use high-end brands like Rolex, Cardiac, Cartier, and Louis Vuitton. Thomas Mann, who is the director of the Port of Louisville, says the counterfeit jewelry is sold on sites like eBay and Craigslist, and they are priced lower but comparably to give the impression the jewelry is real. Homeland Security investigators work to track the jewelry to the original source. And they will actually work with our overseas attaches to work with the foreign country counterparts where the shipment originated to try to shut down those networks overseas. They'll also look at the consignee here in, in the States uh, to uh, affect the, you know, enforcement action to make an arrest, uh, possibly seize any uh, profits that they have from the sale of counterfeit merchandise, uh, and ultimately the goods are, are destroyed. A name brand article from a, an e-commerce platform, it, there's a highly, high likelihood that it's probably counterfeit. Um, if you're purchasing it from Facebook, if you're purchasing it from Craigslist, you know, those are slam dunks for counterfeits. Um, if you want a legitimate article, uh, you should be going to a, an authorized reseller of those products, whether it's a big box store or directly from the, mat, the trademark holder that actually has the rights to those goods. Bottom line is, if it sounds too good to be true, it likely is. And Port Director Mon says that selling counterfeit goods often funds organized crime and sometimes terrorism. Brian. Thanks, Angela. Back to break down this massive bust of fake jewelry is criminal defense attorney Adam Conta and Terry Austin. Terry, I know they're going after the, the major counterfeiters, but can people be charged for buying fake jewelry? You know, you have to be careful. It really does depend. Under federal law, it makes it illegal to traffic counterfeit goods. And what that means is the production or the sale or the transport. But they're trying to protect the trademark. So that's why they're doing that. But federal law doesn't prohibit an individual from buying those counterfeit goods if you're <clears> going <throat> to use it for personal use. 
and most states follow that same rule. If you're buying it and it's personal use, it's not a problem unless you know about it and you intend to defraud or sell. You can know about it as long as it's just for personal use. All right, Adam, where do you get your very real Rolexes? And how do you think people can best protect themselves from being duped? Uh, I get mine from uh, the Diamond District here in New York City. Uh, you got to know, I mean, you either know a jeweler, you have a relationship with a jeweler that you know and trust and has been tried and true over the years, or exactly like you said, you, you know, you go to an authorized reseller. Uh, if you're going online, there are sites like Crown and Caliber and other, you know, watch sites that will give you sort of a guarantee. So if you find it's fake, you can obviously return it. But yeah, I mean, you take these, you take it into, uh, you take your life into your hands with these, with these situations, your, your wallet into your hands, I should say, because there's so many fakes out there. But if you do your research, uh, you can still find good deals and still make sure they're authentic. Absolutely. Now, Anjanette, what other issues can arise from these counterfeit goods? Well, you know, Port Director Mon says oftentimes they're made of materials that are just not good. They're not suitable uh, to be around people, and there have been instances of accidents happening, or say you have something, a counterfeit piece of clothing, it might be flammable, something like that. So um, they can pose a hazard to your health and your safety. Yeah, you know, that won't always happen, of course, but it can happen. Absolutely. I was going to check those jewelry and make sure that they're they're proper. Uh, uh, thank you for everyone for contributing. Uh, definitely, Adam, I'm going to go check out your guy in the Diamond District. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, back to the Sarah Lawrence College sex cult trial, why the defendant was abruptly rushed from the courtroom. Plus, just months after Froster Elizabeth Holmes is convicted, her former lover, Ramesh Sonny Balwani, stands trial in the same courtroom. Coming up, we head to California for the federal trial's opening statements. Welcome back. Testimony is now underway in the federal trial of one-time Theranos COO, Ramesh Sunny Balwani. After a brief delay, opening statements were presented in California on Tuesday. Balwani is charged with 10 counts of fraud and two counts of conspiracy relating to his role in the failed blood testing company. Balwani managed the day-to-day -day operations of the company, overseeing the testing lab, and was instrumental in the decision to use modified third-party analyzers. Elizabeth Holmes, founder and ex-lover of Belwani, was convicted of three counts of fraud and one count of conspiracy in relation to her time with Theranos. Her sentencing is scheduled for September. The two were indicted together, but the trials were separated after Holmes's accusations of Belwani abusing her and controlling this company. Belwani's attorneys have denied these allegations. They claim he did not control Theranos, nor did he steal a dollar from the company. The trial is expected to last for weeks. Criminal defense attorney Adam Costa and Conta, sorry, and co-host Terry Austin are back as we jump into the first days of the second weeks-long Theranos trial. Terry, on top of this highly publicized trial, the Hulu series The Dropout was just released chronicling the rise and fall of Elizabeth Holmes. Are jurors and witnesses expected to steer clear of this new show? Brian, not only should they steer clear of it, they're expected to do that, but the judge is going to remind them to do that because they're supposed to only listen to the evidence in the case that's presented at the trial. The problem with watching these documentaries is that the facts begin to blur. You start to confuse, did I hear that at the trial or was that during that documentary? The other thing is, the way these shows are produced, it makes the viewer believe what actually happened. If you think about other cases like R. Kelly, you hear all of that evidence, you see all the people who are talking about the case, and you start to believe it. So you want jurors not to see that before they come in. You want them to only consider what the evidence is, not even what the lawyers are arguing. And so I think that they're going to have to stay clear of it, and hopefully they'll be reminded to do exactly that, because there is a Sixth Amendment right, obviously, for the right to a fair trial for every defendant. Absolutely. No. Adam. Bowani's trial seems to be mirroring Holmes's from witness order to testimony given. Does having kind of like a roadmap of the trial give Bowani an advantage Holmes didn't have? Well, if you, when you say the question like that, your initial instinct is, yeah, of course. You know, they got to preview all that evidence. They got to preview all of the prosecution's arguments against them. And that is true that they did get to do that. But 
the flip side, and what I think is actually the more important side, is that the prosecution got to get a preview of what defense is going to be. And even though they might have separate defenses, the defense is still going to be close enough that they get to see, oh, here, here are my weaknesses. Like, as a defense attorney, we hate doing retrials because, uh, because the prosecution got to see what they did wrong the first time. And then they get to plug those holes, essentially. And so here, although they do get Balwani does have that advantage of previewing the evidence, I would be really nervous that the prosecution got to see kind of what holes along the way uh, needed to be filled in the Holmes trial. And those holes are going to be filled either by evidence or witnesses. So that's really scary for a defendant, too. So it really cuts both ways. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. To your point, the prosecution's probably going to do it a little bit better. They've, they've had some practice in the past, but Bowani may be a little bit more prepared than Holmes was. Of course, we'll keep eyes on that federal trial as it continues. Thank you both. When we come back, the Sarah Lawrence called a sex cult. Why testimony was interrupted again as accused cult leader Lawrence Ray stands trial. Welcome back. A trial in New York takes a day off as accused Sarah Lawrence sex cult leader Lawrence Ray faces federal charges. A day after the defendant was taken out of the courthouse on a stretcher. This is the second time Ray has been transported to the hospital in the middle of a trial. The first time his attorney says he was, it was because he suffered a seizure. This time no details were released as to why the ambulance was called. The 62-year-old stands accused of racketeering, sex trafficking, and money laundering charges, among others, after allegedly starting what the, he calls the Ray family in 2010, a sex cult made up of his daughter and her college friends. Jurors have heard gripping testimony from several of the victims in this case, including the prosecution's key witness, Claudia Jury. But her testimony has been interrupted several times. Prosecutors didn't even make it through direct examination on Tuesday before court was interrupted by Ray being taken to the hospital. Jury testified about Ray making her and other students do hard labor at the home of Ray's stepfather in North Carolina. She also said Ray had forced her into prostitution, making money for him to the tune of $2.5 million. Prosecutors argue Ray used manipulation on the victims in several ways and used that fear against them. Law and Crimes' Adam Klasfeld has been in the courtroom throughout the proceedings. He joins us now with more insight into Drury's testimony. What would happen typically, the government says, is that Larry Ray would convince these kids into believing that they committed these crimes and then use these confessions to instill this fear that they're going to go to prison. And once he instilled this sense of fear and the sense of indebtedness for these infractions, he'd attach a price tag. In the case of Drury, she says that she would try to pay back at Larry's suggestion with sex work and that this went on for a number of years, that it was seven days a week up to five clients a day and eventually added up to the million. A BDSM became an outlet. Being beaten for her was an outlet because this alleged psychological manipulation and these false confessions had just taken a toll on her sense of self-worth. So this was a period of pretty intense and twisted psychological manipulation that prosecutors say really manifested in a really horrific a stream of abuse against all of these kids. Out of hard labor, humiliation, and this, this psychological coercion seem to be at the heart of this sex cult. Do you expect a doctor testifying about the effects of this abuse on the victims in this trial? Yeah, I would be stunned if there wasn't a doctor. Everything you just described is essentially beyond what a normal juror would be able to understand, meaning that they wouldn't be able to diagnose. Although those those things you can you understand what torture is, you understand uh, some of those other things. You need an expert, you need a doctor to really go through and explain what what happened, what the psychological and medical effects of some of these things are. And uh, and I, without that, you know, you're just you're just kind of it would just be like you or me talking with no with no real background, with no real expertise in it. So I think absolutely there will be an expert, and I think it'll be a critical witness.
Yeah, it's bad. I don't think anyone's gonna disagree that it's bad, but I think with an expert, to your point, we know how bad, where it's bad, and to the extent uh, of how it affected these victims. Terry, taken out on a stretcher again. The jury has to be speculating that something is wrong. What do you think they're thinking, and how could it affect the trial? You know what, Brian? On the one hand, the jury might begin to feel sorry for this defendant. Twice now he's been taken out on a stretcher, and we know also that he had an incident before he actually came into court early on. So he's had three incidents, and you have to wonder, is his illness going to affect the trial? Is it going to affect how these jurors feel about him? Will they give him extra sympathy? Will they relate to him? Because they, too, might have illnesses that affect how they can function. On the other hand, they might get tired of the trial being constantly interrupted. Is he faking it? That's one of the things I think the jury must be thinking. Is he doing this to just avoid prosecution? Yeah, and they seem to be happening when the victim juries on the stand. Could be a part of the speculation. Well, thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.